Okay, so I'm back. Um, okay, so this is my first time doing a live streaming, so um, I'm not quite sure how this works. Um, so if you guys can hear me, just um, leave your comments in the chat box so I know that everything is working fine. Okay, so um, I will start with a brief review of the unit 5, which is kinematics. So when it comes to kinematics, it literally just means the reaction rate um, in chemistry in all types of the chemical reactions. So then first off, I need to define uh, what it means by the reaction rate. And then I want to know why we need to study the reaction rate. Um, so reaction rate literally means the speed of a reaction. So the speed of the reaction matters in um, the everyday life. Um, so Um, so, for example, from graphite to a diamond, this is a spontaneous reaction, which means that it just occurs naturally at room temperature. Even at room temperature, you can convert a graphite to diamond, but you will never have a chance to observe the reaction. Why is that? It's because it's going to take forever. It takes about 1 billion to 3 billion years um, for a graphite um, to be converted from a um, to be converted to the diamond form, which means um, it's basically impractical to our real life. Um, it's it's just irrelevant to my life. Like um, the average lifespan for human beings, like eighty years, ninety years. So one billion year, um, it doesn't really matter to us. So that's why we need to study the reaction rate, and we want to study the reaction rate of different um, reactions. Am I going to do go over every unit today? No, 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 no. Um, that's way too many units. Um, so I think I'm gonna focus on unit five because I've already uploaded four videos from unit one to unit four. So I will briefly go over unit five, and um, and then I'm gonna do uh, and then we can go over a couple of FRQ and MCQ questions, um, r related to unit one to unit five. Um, the fiberable notes, I think they're pretty good. I think it's very comprehensive. Um, but they have some of the extra, extra stuff that you don't need to know for AP Chemistry. In general, I think it's really good. And the Organic Chemistry Tutor is also pretty good. Okay, so here's an example of uh, a really, really, really slow um, reaction speed. Then here's another example for super fast reaction speed. So when halogen gas reacts with oxygen gas to produce the water, um, hydrogen in gas reacts with oxygen. Uh, the reaction is very like vigorous. Um, that's why you know, like it catches the fire and then you can see the flame. Um, so usually if the reaction rate is very, very large, like very extra stuff um yeah there are some of the extra stuff that's usually not so important to ap chemistry and then that you wouldn't really be tested um like some of the diagrams like some advanced stuff
Um, okay, so the first up, reaction rate is defined by the change in the concentration of a reactant or product per unit time. Remember that we always measure um, the amount of the reactant or product um, in terms of the concentration, not the molar mass, not the mass, not the volume, um, not the number of the moles. It's always the concentration. So if the concentration doesn't change, then it means that this reaction is not actually going on. There's no reaction going on. Um, we're going to um, learn more, more about that later in equilibrium. Um, so let's say for this reaction, um, the reactant is represented as the blue line, and then um, the product is represented as uh, the red line. So the product goes from zero, and then the concentration gradually increases, while the concentration of the reactant gradually decreases. Then the reaction rate for this reaction will be equal to um, delta change in the concentration of the reactant, which is um, blue, divided by um, the span of the time, delta t, and then I'm going to put a negative sign in front of that because the blue, the blue line is actually decreasing, which means its rate of change is a negative value. But for the reaction rate, I just want a positive value or an absolute value. Or I can represent it as delta, um, which is change in the concentration of the red, which is the product, divided by time. And for the reactant, the amount is increasing or the concentration is increasing, so I don't have to put any negative sign on it. Okay, so here is an actual example. Um, so um, it is a reaction that occurs between um, dinitrogen, dinitrogen pentaoxide, nitrogen dioxide, and oxygen. And obviously, these two curves represent the products, and then this um, purple curve represents the reactant. So it is a decomposition of the dinitri dinitrogen pentaoxide. So N2O5 in gas decomposed into nitrogen dioxide in gas and oxygen. And my next step is um, balancing the equation. So it's going to be um, 2 nitrogen dioxide because on the left side I have 2 nitrogen. On the, on the right side right now I have only 1 nitrogen. So I'm going to multiply this whole molecule by 2. So I get 2 nitrogen dioxide. And now let's take a look at the number of the oxygen. On the left side I have 5 oxygen. On the right side I have 2 times 2, 4 oxygen. And then, okay, so then I need only one extra oxygen for this. Then I'm going to put one half. So it's one half uh, moles of the oxygen molecules. And eventually, I want to convert all the coefficients into a whole number or um, the integers. So I multiply all the coefficients by 2. So it's 2 dinit dinitrogen pentaoxide um, decomposed into 4 nitrogen dioxide and gas and 1 mole of the oxygen gas. And now I'm going to write the reaction rate. The reaction rate is equal to either negative of delta um, concentration of the reactant, dinitrogen pentaoxide over time, or the rate of change in the concentration of the product, let's say um, di nitrogen dioxide over time. The thing is, um, these two uh, these two agents, reactant and product, they don't have the equal coefficient, which means I will have to balance it. Because what I mean by 2 and 4 is every time 2 moles of the dinit dinitrogen pentaoxide is consumed, then 4 moles of the nitrogen dioxide is produced. But when it comes to rate, I want to have the exact same number, um, no matter what what reagent I use to do the calculation. So I will have to put the reciprocal of 2. So it's negative 1 half of um, change in the concentration of the reactant over time or one fourth of the change in the concentration of the product over time. Or you can use the oxygen, concentration of the oxygen to represent it. But oxygen only has coefficient of one. So it will be delta um, concentration of the oxygen over delta T. Okay, so there are couples of factors that affect the reaction rate. One is the reaction concentration. <clears throat> so greater reaction concentration means the greater uh, reaction rate or the faster speed of the reaction. Um, the second is the surface area. Um, okay, so um, let's say you have the granulated sugar and then the powdered sugar and then you're going to dissolve it in water. Then which one dissolves faster? Of course, it's the powdered sugar, right? Um, so the, the greater the surface area, the larger the reaction rate. 
I mean, the dissolving sugar in water, it's not actually a chemical change. That's a physical change, but it's very similar. So either for the chemical reaction or the physical change, the greater surface area always leads to a larger reaction rate. And then the next is the temperature. So as for the temperature, higher temperature always lead to the faster reaction rate. So that's why we use the fridge um, in, in, modern, in modern world um, to make sure that we keep the food fresh. Um, okay, so everything like including food um it goes through oxidization um oxidation or um it just it, the food is the food just goes bad um if you don't keep it in the fridge so by keeping the food in the fridge you are lowering the temperature to um and then eventually you are lowering the reaction rate so you are actually just slowing down the decomposition of the food it does not really prevent food from um, like being spoiled and then the very last one will be the catalyst um, so the catalyst, um, so not every single reaction has a catalyst, but for some of the reactions, when you put a catalyst in it, um, the catalyst reacts with the reactants and then it um, speed up the reaction rate. So there are like four factors in total. And when it comes to rate law, we only study the relationship between the reaction rate and the reactant concentration. Um, so one thing you need to remember is that when you have the overall chemical equation, the coefficients of that chemical reaction has nothing to do with a rate law. So how I write the rate law is um, rate is equal to the reaction rate constant K multiplied by um, the reactant A to the power of X, reactant B to the power of Y. Of course, they are measured in terms of the concentration. So let's say here is a chemical reaction. 2A react with 3 moles of B to produce a compound A to B3. Okay, that what um, the type of mistakes that a lot of people make is um, they just take the coefficient of the reactants A and B and then they write the rate law as rate is equal to K times concentration of A squared, concentration of B cubed. This is completely wrong. This is completely wrong. And this is one of the most common mistakes So, oh, what about pressure? So pressure, when it comes to gas, it's actually the same concept as the concentration. So pressure is proportional to the concentration. So basically, um, when you're increasing the pressure, you're increasing the concentration. Okay, then how do we actually determine a rate law? It is only by the experiments. So we'll have to do experiments multiple times or multiple trials. And then for the, every trial, you are going to adjust the concentration, initial concentration of each of the reactants. Um, so let's say for, for, uh, for this reaction, you have two different types of the reactants. One is um, the green molecule um, the, or the green atom. The other one is the red particle. Um, and then you are going to increase the concentration of the green first. And then you are going to observe what kind of change occurs for the rate. rate. And then next, you are going to keep the concentration of the green at, as constant, and you're going to increase the concentration of the red, um, the red particle. And again, you're going to observe what kind of change or how many times um, the reaction rate has increased. So higher pressure is equal to higher concentration and faster reaction. Yeah, exactly. So let's take a look at actual type of questions that you will see in AP, in AP chemistry. Um, okay, so let's say here's the reaction. Two moles of the nitrogen monoxide gas reacts with chlorine gas, one mole of chlorine gas, and it produced um, two of the NOCl in gas. Okay, and there are three trials, experiment one, two, and three. And for each of the experiment, um, the concentration of both of the reactants are slightly different from each other. So first up, what I can do is I can compare the experiment one and two. When I compare experiment one and two, you observe that concentration of the nitrogen monoxide has not changed, but the concentration of the chlorine gas has tripled. And the initial rate has actually increased by nine times. So how I can write it is, okay, 3 to the power of x is equal to 9. Then x is equal to 2. Then what does 2 represent? 2 is the reaction order or um, the exponent for the concentration of the chlorine. Remember that for this reaction, how we write the rate law is rate is equal to the reaction rate constant K times concentration of the nitrogen monoxide to the power of x. Um, times concentration of the chlorine gas to the power of y. Well, actually, then I'm going to change it to y.
So when the concentration of the chlorine increased by three times, um, I'm just going to put three as the base, and then I'm going to put the reaction order or the exponent of the chlorine gas. Um, so three to the power of y is equal to nine, y is equal to two. So I'm going to plug in two for the concentration of the chlorine. And next, I can try to compare, let's say, experiment one and three, because when I compare experiment one and three, the concentration of the chlorine is kept constant, while the concentration of the nitrogen monoxide has um, increased by four times. And if I compare the initial rate, the initial rate has increased by four times as well. Then it is four to the power of x is equal to four. Then x is equal to one. This means that the concentration of the nitrogen monoxide has the exponent of one. So the rate law is rate is equal to K, the reaction rate constant, multiplied by the concentration of the nitrogen monoxide to the power of one times the concentration of the chlorine gas to the power of two. And then we call this exponent reaction order. So for this reaction in total, uh, we, we say that this reaction is like th the third order reaction. Okay, so here's another example. Um, so ammonium NH4 plus the aqueous state reacts with uh, nitrous um, nitrate in aqueous um, and then they produce nitrogen gas and then two moles of the water molecules. Um, and there are three trials as well. Um, so I will have to find like two trials and I will, I will have to compare two trials um, in which one of the reactant has changed the concentration while the other reactant um, keeps the same concentration. Okay, then I can compare experiment one and two. For experiment one and two, the concentration of the ammonium has not changed while the concentration of the, um, the, concentration of the nitrate has uh, increased by two times. And then the initial rate has increased by two times as well. Okay, so again, the rate law for this um, overall reaction goes by rate is equal to reaction rate constant K uh, multiplied by the concentration of the ammonium to the power of X times the concentration of the nitrate to the power of Y. The different graphs of different orders, yes, I will go over um, all of the three graphs um, yeah, later. Um, so again, the change in the concentration of the nitrate corresponds to the order y. So 2 to the power of y is equal to 2, then y is equal to 1. So I'm just going to plug in 1 in place of y. Um, and then next, I can try to compare experiment 2 and 3. For experiment 2 and 3, the concentration of the nitrate um, is constant, and then the concentration of the ammonium has increased by twice. So now it's 2 to the power of 2 to the power of x is equal to, and then the initial rate has increased by 2 times as well. 2 to the power of x is equal to 2, x is equal to 1. So again, I'm going to plug in 1 for the x. So in total, the rate for this reaction is equal to the reaction rate constant k multiplied by um, the ammonium to the power of 1 multiplied by the concentration of the nitrite to the power of 1. And now we have this concentration versus time graph. Um, so concentration of a reactant decreases over time, obviously, while the concentration of the product increases over time. And then um, the change in the con the change in the concentration really depends on the coefficients. Um, so let's say um, the reaction in between um, sulfur trioxide, sulfur dioxide, and oxygen is. SO2 in gas reacts with oxygen gas and um, it produces SO3 gas. Um, so it's going to be 2, 1, and 2. It's the balanced equation. 
Um, so it means that every time two moles of the um, sulfur dioxide is consumed, two moles of the sulfur trioxide is produced, and then one mole of the oxygen gas is produced. So that's why the change in the concentration of the the, the change in the concentration of the oxygen is obviously less than the change in the concentration of the sulfur dioxide and the change in the concentration of the sulfur trioxide. Okay, the thing is, most of the times, the concentration of versus time graph is curved, and eventually we want to have a linear, linear graph. Um, so we're going to do some... Um, we're gonna deal with the numbers. We're gonna play with numbers, and then we're gonna plot first. Off, we're gonna plot the concentration versus time graph, um, and then if this graph by itself is a linear linear graph, then it means that it's the zeros order. So for the zeros order, it means the rate is equal to the reaction rate constant k multiplied by the concentration of the reactant to the power of zero. And we know that any number to the power of zero is equal to one unless this number is zero. So that's basically equal to k. This means that the reaction rate does not depend on the concentration of the reactant A for this reaction. And but most of the times, um, the concentration versus time graph is going to be curved. Um, and then I can try to do more calculation. Um, so first off, I can try to manipulate the data um, by plugging in the concentration in ln. Now I have the ln concentration versus time graph. And if this graph is linear, then it means it's the first order reaction. So this means rate is equal to k times um, concentration of the reactant A to the power of 1. And then the last one, if the first two trial doesn't work, then you can try to plot uh, 1 over the concentration, the reciprocal of the concentration over time. And if this graph shows a positive linear relationship, then it means that this is a second order reaction. So rate is equal to K times concentration of A to the power of 2. Next is the half-life. So half-life is the amount of time taken for a reactant concentration to decrease to one half of its original value. Um, so let's say um, at the very beginning, um, <clears throat> a reactant or, or a substance has a, um, a, a 10,000 um, 10,000 10, molecules, that after a certain period of time, that its amount has decreased to 500. And after another period of time, its amount has decreased to 250. And after a while, it has decreased to 125 as well. And uh, for the first order reaction only, the half-life is always constant. So the amount of time taken for this reactant to have is exactly the same. No matter if it's going from 1,000 to 500, or 500 to 250, or 250 to 125. And then we can apply the formula of the half-life, which is um, ln2 divided by the reaction rate constant k. And ln2 is approximately 0 0.693. And you don't have to memorize this formula because it's, <clears throat> um, it's listed in the formula sheet. And you are not required to memorize um, how to calculate the half-life or the zeros order or the second order. Um, that's not going to be tested on the AP chemistry test. Okay, so again, reaction order um, versus a linear graph. So what we are trying to do is I'm trying to find a linear relationship between the concentration of the reactant and versus time. And then based on what type of graph it, it, it is, um, I can determine the reaction order. So if it shows the concentration of the reactant over time, and this is a linear graph, then it means it's a zeros order reaction. And if it's ln concentration of the reactant over time, and then it shows a um, linear relationship, then it's a first order reaction. And if it is a reciprocal of the concentration, or 1 over A over time, and then it shows a linear relationship, then it's a second order reaction. Okay, so now we're done with um, the relationship between the concentration and time, the relationship between initial rate and then the concentration. Um, okay, so all of those were the macroscopic perspective, which means we can actually measure the concentration or measure the time. Um, but now we're going to take a look at what's actually happening on the, on the 
part, part, particle level or the molecule level um, that we need to study reaction mechanism. So reaction mechanism, I just call it a recipe for the chemical reaction. Um, so it, it includes a series of elementary steps. So let's say um, I want to do baking, then my ingredients um, in the recipe is like flour, milk, like egg yolk, um, and then a bunch of other stuff, and eventually I will have the bread as the product. But this recipe, but but this ingredient list does not really tell me like what each step is. Like let's say for step one, I will have to mix like egg yolk and then the flour. Uh, like step two, I have to add um, butter, and step three, I will have to set the oven at let's say four hundred degree, and step five, I have to bake it. So there are multiple steps. Uh, for this recipe but ingredients list is like an overall chemical reaction it only shows the initial reactants and then the final product it does not show what's actually going on um and how do you count the pi and sigma bonds in a compound like this oh okay um so um that's actually for topic for unit 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 two for chemical bonds um i will briefly go over it um, so pi bond versus sigma bond, it's very, very simple. So any of the single bond, it doesn't matter if it's carbon hydrogen single bond or the carbon carbon single bond or carbon oxygen single bond, whatever single bond is always one sigma bond. And then the double bond is always one sigma bond and then one pi bond. And triple bond is one sigma bond and two pi bond. Um, so let's say, for example, for this molecule, it has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. It has um, 10. Um, no, actually, here we have um, the, the carbon and nitrogen. So in between the carbon and nitrogen, we have a triple bond. So uh, it's going to be uh, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Um, so we have 11 sigma bonds, and then we have 1, 2, 3. And then a uh, triple bond here, so four, five, five pi bond. Or let's say for this molecule, um, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine sigma bond, and then you have one, two, three, four, four pi bond. Okay, so going back to the reaction mechanism. Um, so reaction mechanism includes a series of elementary steps, just like the recipe for the baking includes like step-by-step um, -step guidelines. And then each of the steps is called elementary step. Um, and then remember that for elementary step, you barely see that more than two molecules react. Um, so most of the times it's two particles react with each other. You barely see like three or greater than three particles react at the same time. Okay, so for example, uh, for this reaction of nitrogen dioxide reacting with um, carbon monoxide um, to produce nitrogen monoxide and carbon dioxide, um, it has two steps, two elementary steps. The first step is nitrogen dioxide react with itself um, to produce nitrogen trioxide and then nitrogen monoxide. This is step one. And then for the step two, the nitrogen trioxide produced in step one reacts with carbon monoxide to produce nitrogen dioxide and carbon dioxide. This is step two. So there are two elementary steps. Okay, and remember the nitrogen trioxide is produced in step one and it's consumed immediately in step two. So for these type of, um, for these type of reagent, we call it intermediate. And you cannot find intermediate in the reactant side or the product side of the overall chemical equation. It is just formed during the, um, the reaction process and then consumed. Um, and for, uh, for the elementary step, um, some of the some of the elementary step is fast. Some of the other ele elementary steps are slow. And then we usually pick the slowest elementary step, and then we call it rate determining step. Okay, so let's go back to the baking example. Um, let's say there are like four steps in total, and then like first three steps takes like five minutes each, and then the last step baking takes forty minutes. Then what actually determines like how long it takes for me to bake is the last step, the longest step, um, the step that takes the, the longest amount of time. So that's exactly the same for the reaction mechanism. The slowest step 
is what we call by the rate determining step. And this is especially important because we're going to use this step to try to write on the rate law. So remember on the last slide, I said, um, so barely three or more than three particles react at the same time for the elementary step. It's because uh, when it comes to particle level, uh, reaction actually occurs only when there is a collision or effective collision between um, two particles, no matter it's atoms or the molecules. Um, and then um, if you if you want the effective collision to occur, then these like particles have to carry enough energy to overcome the activation energy, so the bond actually break because the react because the chemical reaction is basically um, breaking up the bond, the formation of the new bonds. So you have to break the bond first. If you want to break the bonds, then the particles um, should carry enough energy. That's one um, requirement. The second requirement is the right orientation. Um, so what I mean, what I mean by the orientation is the right angle or the right direction. So let's say for the water molecule, you have two hydrogen and then the oxygen. And then let's say it's going to collide with some other molecules. Then are these molecules colliding on the oxygen side or the hydrogen side? So this is going to make a huge difference on um, if the effective collision occurs or not. So if there are three particles involved, then it's very not likely that these three particles have enough energy at the same time, and then they collide at the right orientation at the same time. So it's not like impossible, but it barely happens. Most likely it's two particles colliding with each other with enough energy and then at the right orientation. So this is why out of all of those collisions between the particles, only a very small fraction of the collision leads to the actual reaction. Because not any collision means always oh, just leads to a reaction. Um, like some of the collision has not enough energy, then the, bond, the bonds and the reactants do not break. Or some of the particles that collide with enough energy, but they're not at the right orientation, then, not, then um, the, the, the new bonds do not actually form. Um, so... Um, so we're going to use, um, so we can use this Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve to actually represent it. Um, so Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve is, uh, is something that you'll be tested in MP chemistry for sure. On the right, on the x-axis, usually we have energy or the speed of the particles. On the y-axis, we have number of the molecules, number of the particles, or the percentage of the particles um, in the sample. And the higher peak doesn't really mean that it carries high energy. That's one of the misconceptions. Um, so actually the higher peak, um, the for the higher peak, the peak is usually skewed toward the left. But for the lower peak, the whole curve is skewed toward the right. Um, and then this means that for the higher peak, most of the particles in this sample has low energy. And for this lower peak, most of the energy, most of the particles in this sample has a higher energy. So in total, like this green curve with a lower peak represents um, a sample at a higher temperature. And then um, you must have learned in unit um, three uh, when you were learning the ideal gas law and then kinetic molecular theory. Um, not all the particles, not all the gas particles um, in a sample um, carry the same amount of energy. So some of the gas particles carry very little amount of energy. Some of the ga other gas particles carry a lot more energy. Some other particles carry like a, a very, very high amount of energy. Um, it's just like different proportions in a sample. And then um, if you want um, the collision to be effective, then the particles have to carry enough energy. And then we call this um, threshold the activation energy. Um, what I mean by that is the particles um, have to carry a certain amount of energy. And then if the particle have more than that, then it's over the threshold, it's over the standard. So now the reaction actually initiates or start. So for a certain reaction, the activation energy is always the same. It doesn't change unless you, you put the catalyst in it. So higher temperature actually increases the reaction rate because higher, higher temperature means that more percentage of the particles um, in the reactants or in, in the sample carries um, the energy that's greater than activation energy compared to low temperature sample.
Um, so as I stated before, the rate determining step is always the slowest elementary step. So it differs from reaction to reaction. And then what's really important here is the coefficient of the rate determining step can be used to write the rate law, um, which can be confusing because um, coefficient of the overall reaction cannot be used to write the rate law. So let's say, uh, for example, step one is the rate determining step. Then it means rate um, is equal to K reaction rate constant multiplied by the concentration of the um, nitrogen dioxide to the power of two because two nitrogen dioxide means it's two moles of the nitrogen dioxide. The coefficient is two. So I will raise the concentration to the power of two. Okay, so if I ever write an overall reaction, then the overall reaction is nitrogen dioxide plus carbon monoxide um, produce um, carbon and nitrogen monoxide and then the carbon dioxide okay so this is the overall reaction so overall reaction again cannot be used to write the rate law um, if you have the overall reaction only then you will always have to do the experiments and then do at least like two or three trials to figure out uh, the reaction order of each of the reactants but if you are given each of the elementary step and then you know which one is the rate determining step then you can directly use that step to write the rate law So here's another example. Um, so there are four steps, there are four elementary steps for this reaction. And then the slowest one is the first one. Then it means that for this reaction, the rate low is, is equal to, rate is equal to the reaction rate constant K times the concentration of the nitri dinitrogen pentaoxide to the power of one. Because for this rate determining step, the coefficient of the reactant is just one. And then now it's the catalyst. So um, catalyst is something um, that does not actually participate in the reaction or it's not actually consumed during a reaction. Uh, but it actually does participate in a reaction and then it's um, and, and then it's formed again later. So let's say hydrogen peroxide dissociated into water and oxygen. So usually I wear like soft contacts, like soft lens contacts during the day. And then I will have to clean it every day using the hydrogen peroxide by putting it in this like special um, like neutralizer and in a neutralizer at the bottom like there is a metal coated with like palladium PD and then what it does is it actually speeds up the dissociation reaction of the hydrogen peroxide so hydrogen peroxide um, if you directly like put it in your eyes it burns it sting my eyes a lot um, but if you put if you, if you put the contact lens in this um, neutralizer, then um, you will see that a lot of bubbles came out, which means the reaction is like um, the reaction is going on like very fast. Um, and then in the morning, after like six or eight hours, you will see you will actually observe that all the hydrogen peroxide has been neutralized to the water. So if you take a look at each step of the elementary step, then what you will observe is catalyst is consumed first and then formed again. And then catalyst, um, what it actually does is um, it actually lowers the activation energy. Um, so remember that's like Maxwell Boltzmann distribution curve. So um, given that usually activation energy threshold is right here, um, one way to increase the reaction rate is by raising the temperature. By raising the temperature, um, the whole curve is skewed toward the rate, and then more of the particles in the reactant will carry enough um, energy to overcome the activation energy. And that's one way to um, to to uh, make the reaction rate faster. The second way is to use a catalyst. But by using a catalyst, you're actually lowering the threshold. You are lowering the standard. Um, so even if the temperature is kept constant, more particles uh, will carry the energy to overcome over um, the activation energy. This is the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution curve. And the left, this is just a regular potential energy curve, um, which shows the potential energy of the reactants and the products. So this is the reactant, this is the products. Um, so um, this is an exothermic reaction because the product is obviously at a lower energy level compared to the reactants, but it doesn't really matter for the, um, the activation energy. So activation energy on this curve is the difference between the peak and the reactant. So this amount represents the activation energy. 
um, which means if you want this reaction to occur or initiate, you will have to put in that amount of energy first. So this explains exactly why the graphite to diamond reaction does not occur in a very um, it, it does not really occur or um, it's like super slow at room temperature because at room temperature like they the the, the graphite graphite particles just don't have that many energy to overcome the activation energy so that's why the reaction rate is so slow but by putting the catalyst in uh, or mixing the catalyst with the reactants it lowers the activation energy so now it, it will be much easier for the particles to overcome the activation energy and initiate the reaction which makes the reaction rate faster um so that's it for unit five so it's a like very quick um like overview of unit five and then next what i want to do is um i want to go over these um questions um on the past paper and then it includes all the topics from unit one to unit five. So unit one is um, atomic structures and properties, the periodic trend. Unit two is chemical bonds, um, ionic bond, covalent bond, metallic bonds. Um, and unit three is intermolecular force, um, solubility, and then ideal gas flow. Um, and then um, electrochem. Uh, what do you exactly mean by electrochem? Do you mean like electron configuration or? Oh, or do you mean by the unit nine? Like thermochemistry, like galvanic cell and then the electrolytic cell? Mm, okay, so I'm not going to go over Unit 9 today, um, but I think I will go over Unit 9 probably on Saturday. Because mm -hmm. I'm going to hold this like live stream session until um, until until May 1, until May 1st. No, actually the 8th or 30th. Um, yeah, titration. I know like titration, Unit 8, um, um, acid base, and then Unit 9, like those are the most important topics or most confusing topics. I would say starting from equilibrium, so equilibrium, acid base, and like galvanic cell, electrolytic cell, um, those are three most confusing topics. Um, I will try to go over them, like not not today. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so let's say, um, well, let's get started with rate related questions because we literally just went over the rate laws. Um, okay, so this is an FRQ question. Um, I think it's from 2019 or 2020. Uh, spectroscopy will go get into in detail. Yeah, spectroscopy is included in today's um in, in today's material. So nitrogen dioxide is produced as a byproduct of combustion of um, fossil fuel in, in internal combustion engines. At elevated temperatures, nitrogen dioxide gas decomposes according to the equation below. The concentration of a sample of nitrogen dioxide is monitored as it decomposes and is recorded on the graph directly below. The two graphs that follow it are derived from the original data. So there are three graphs in total. One is concentration of the uh, nitrogen dioxide versus time. The second one is the, the reciprocal of the concentration versus time. The last one is LN concentration versus time. Okay, and then as I stated before, we're always looking for a linear relationship. And it's so obvious that the second one is a linear relationship. And then this graph is the reciprocal of the concentration versus time, which means this is, okay, what is the order of this reaction? When it shows a linear relationship between the reciprocal of the concentration versus time. That's going to be a second order reaction, right? So explain how the graph indicates that the reaction is second order. Um, so for this type of um, explanation or like justify your answer type of question, it's actually very simple. You just need to write one sentence um, because the one over concentration of the nitrogen dioxide versus time graph 
is linear. That's it. Great. Second order. Um, B, write the rate law for the decomposition of the nitrogen dioxide. Okay, since this is the second order um, in terms of the nitrogen dioxide, then rate is equal to um, reaction rate constant K times concentration of the nitrogen dioxide squared. That's it. And consider two possible mechanisms for the decomposition reaction. One, is the rate law described by mechanism one shown below consistent with a rate law you wrote in part B? Just by your answer. Okay, so there are mechanism one and there are two elementary steps. The first one is the slow, um, slow step. The second one is the fast step, which means the which means the rate determining step is step one. And then rate determining step, um, for the rate determining step, we can use the coefficients for that to directly write the rate law. So according to this mechanism, rate is equal to reaction rate constant K times concentration of the NO squared. And then these two match each other. So this is a possible, or like this, this is consistent with a rate law that I write in the last part. And when it says justify your answer, you just need to write that rate law is directly determined by the stoichiometry of the rate determining step. And step one has two moles of nitrogen dioxide as the reactants. And number two is the rate law described by mechanism two consistent with a rate law that you write in part B. Okay, there's another mechanism. Um, so it's like there are different recipes given that the, the ingredients and the product is the same. So step one is a fast equilibrium. Okay, so for the fast equilibrium, it means that this reaction is very, very fast. And then the forward reaction rate is equal to the reverse reaction rate. And the second step is the slow step, which means for um, question number two or for mechanism two, the rate goes by rate is equal to reaction rate constant K multiplied by the concentration of the dinitrogen um, tetraoxide to the power of one. The thing is dinitrogen tetraoxide is not um, the uh, one of the reactants for our reaction, for this reaction. Okay, then I will have to rewrite um, the concentration of the dinitrogen tetraoxide in terms of um, nitrogen dioxide. And then how I do it is by using the fast equilibrium. Since it's equilibrium, then it means that means the forward reaction rate is equal to the reverse rate. So for the forward rate, let's say the reaction rate constant is K1, and then for the reverse, let's say it's K2. It doesn't really matter how you label it. It can be Kx, Ky, K2, K3, K4, Kz, whatever. It's just a constant. So for the forward reaction rate, that will be K1 multiplied by the concentration of the nitrogen dioxide squared. For the reverse rate, that is K2 multiplied by the concentration of dinitrogen tetraoxide to the power of one. So I can rewrite concentration of N2O4 as K1 over K2 multiplied by concentration of NO2 squared. And then I'm gonna plug this into this reaction, this rate law. So eventually rate law states that rate is equal to K times K1 over K2 multiplied by NO2 squared. And remember that all of these K values, they are just some reaction rate constant. They are just constants. So when you just multiply by multiply them together or just um or when you do this some like division, they're still a constant. So eventually it's going to be some kind of reaction rate constant. 
uh, multiply by NO2 squared. So it's still the second order reaction for the NO2. So for mechanism two, um, it still holds true for what we wrote for the rate law in part B. So both mechanisms are possible. So mechanism um, are something that we cannot really test um, using um, the experiment or lab. So we can just come up with like couples of different hypotheses for the mechanism and then try to figure out which one is fast, which one is slow, and then try to write the um, reaction rate, uh, the rate law, and then see if it complies with what we already know. And for this case, both mechanism one and two um, seems like correct. And then next, um, this is a multiple choice question. Um, the data from a study of the decomposition of nitrogen dioxide gas um, to form nitrogen monoxide and oxygen gas are given in the table above. Which of the following rate laws is consistent with the data? Okay, so the time interval is 0 to 100, 100 to 20, 200 to 30. So the time interval is 100 seconds. Um, and then the concentration of the nitrogen dioxide decreases from 0 0.5 to 0 0.364, 0 0.286, and 0 0.235. Okay, so eventually what it's asking is to find the, the reaction order in terms of the NO2. And then again, how I do it is by finding the linear relationship between the time and then um, concentration or the ln of the concentration or reciprocal of the concentration because the time interval is consistent. So I just need to find like which column of the data has the constant interval. Mm. And for concentration of the NO2, okay, it decreased by negative 0.14 approximately, and then it decreased by approximately negative 0.8, and then it decreased by negative 0.05. Okay, so this is not constant. So it's not NO2. And then next, ln NO2. Um, so it decreased by negative 0.5. Uh, 3 approximately, approximately and then by negative 0 0.25 and then by negative 0 0.2. Again, the interval between each of the data is not constant for ln concentration. And then the last one, reciprocal of the concentration. Um, the interval is negative 0 0.75, negative 0 0.75, and sorry, positive 0 0.75. And another positive 0 0.75. So now I do see that the, the, the interval between each of the data is constant for time and the reciprocal of the concentration, which means these two data form a linear relation, um, which means this is, what is the reaction order? Okay, um, anybody want to type the answer in the chat box? Okay, so if there's a linear relationship between time and the concentration, that it is zero's order. And if there's a linear relationship between the time and the ln concentration, then it's first order. If it's time versus the reciprocal of the concentration, then it's the second order. So it, the right answer should be B. Okay, any question uh, for unit five? or any question for a rate law. Oh, is this unimolecular? Yes. So going back to the original question, um, it is um, two of the NO2 de decomposed into two of the nitrogen monoxide and oxygen gas. Um, okay, so if you don't have any other questions, then I think I can go over, is there a similar problem? Um, not for today. I think for today, we have only a few reaction rate um, problem. So I did take a look at the most recent past papers from 2019 to 2022. And then I didn't see that many rate law related questions. There are way more, I, I do see way more unit three intermolecular forces um, and acid-base 
and equilibrium, a lot more equilibrium. Uh, actually, we have one more here. The following equation represents the decomposition of di dinitrogen pentaoxide for which the rate low is rate is equal to K times N2O5. A sample of pure N2O5 in gas is placed in an evacuated container and allowed to decompose at a constant temperature of 300 Kelvin. The concentration of dinit dinitrogen pentaoxide in the container is measured over a period of time and the measurements what is the next question for this question? The concentration of the N2O5 in the container is measured over a period of time and the measurements are recorded in the following table. So this is time versus the concentration. Um, determine the value of the rate constant K for the reaction and include units in your answer. So we're already given that this is a first order reaction. So rate is equal to K times the concentration of the N2O5. Uh, okay, and then how we actually approach this question is because this is first order reaction. And then for the first order reaction, we know that half-life is always constant. Okay, now let's see. When the concentration of N2O5, which is a reactant, decreases from 0 0.160 to 0 0.08, that's multiplied by one half. Uh, when it decreases to 0 0.04, that's multiplied by one half again. Okay, so for each of the data, the concentration is halved, and the time difference is the same. The time interval is always 1.67 hours, which means the half-life for this first-order reaction is 1.67 hours. And half-life is equal to ln2 divided by the reaction rate constant k, or 0 0.693 over the reaction rate constant k. So the reaction rate constant k is equal to, by rearranging the equation, 0 0.693 divided by 1.67 hour. Remember that for the reaction rate constant, we always need to include a unit. So the answer is 0 0.415 per hour. And depending on the reaction order, um, the reaction rate constant K will have different units. So the first order reaction, second order reaction, and then the zeroth order reaction will have different unit for K. And question number B, the following mechanism is proposed for the decomposition of N2O5. Um, there are three steps. Identify which step is of the proposed mechanism is the rate determining step and justify your answer in terms of the rate law given, okay? Uh, and remember the rate determining step, according to rate determining step, I can always use the stoichiometry to come up with a rate law. So the rate law for this reaction states the rate is equal to K times the concentration of and to 5 to the power of 1, which means for the rate determining step, I should have one mole of the N205 as the reactant, and then whatever the product. Then the only um, elementary step that satisfies this um, is step 1. For step 2, we have NO2 and NO3 only. For step 3, we do have N205, but we also have NO. So according to step 3, it will be rate is equal to K times N205 times NO. So that's not right. So how I justify the answer is according to the rate law, the rate determining step has only one mole of N2O5 as the reactant. Um, that's it. For most of the FRQ questions, when it says explain or justify, one sentence is usually enough. 
um, usually the answer is one point explanation is one point or answer and justification is one point in total. Um, but you don't have to write too much for explanation. There are couples of exceptions, so such as intermolecular force. Um, if it's comparing the, the intermolecular force of two, two molecules or two substances, then you will have to write a little bit more. Or if it's about the kinetic molecular theory, then you will have to elaborate a little bit more. But for most of the other types of FRQ questions, um, like one sentence, like one or two sentences is like enough. Um, so, okay, that's it. So I think that's it for um, the right law um, related questions. Um, so I think I should go over other questions um, like related to unit one unit and unit one to unit four. So I'm going to start from this question. Um, a student reacts 0.3 grams of methyl um, salicylate with a stoichiometric amount of a strong base. This product is then um, acidified to produce salicylic acid crystals. For every one mole of uh, the methyl salicylate reactant used, one mole of salicylic acid crystal is produced. Calculate the maximum mass in grams of the salicylic acid crystals that could be produced in this reaction. Okay, um, so even though I don't really know the overall equation, but I know that one mole of the C8H8O3 uh, will produce one mole of the HC7H5O3. The ratio is like the mole ratio is one to one. And then uh, it says with stoichiometry amount of strong base, which means the amount of strong base um, is exactly um, the is the right amount to react with um, all of the all of the methyl salicylate. Then the maximum mass of the the product. Okay, so this is a typical stoichiometry problem. Um, so again, um, it is a typical stoichiometry problem, and then what you're given is the um, the mass of the reactant, and now you are required to you're asked to find the mass of the product. So we cannot do the conversion between the mass directly. We always have to do the mole mole conversion uh, when it comes to stoichiometry. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the mole conversion between the reactant C eight H eight O three, and then mole conversion to the product HC7H5O3. This is what I can do based on this chemical reaction. And then um, how I get to the mole of the reactant is by doing, by converting the mass of C8H8O3 into number of moles. And then um, convert it back to the number of moles of the product and then convert that to the mass of the product. Okay, so for the conversion between the mass and then the moles, we're gonna use the formula, uh, mass is equal to number of moles multiplied by the molar mass. So going backward, going from mass to the mole, that will be number of mole is equal to mass divided by the molar mass. So it's going to be 0 0.3 grams of the methyl um, salicylate divided by its molar mass, which is 152.15 grams per mole. So now you have the moles of the um, methyl salicylate, and now you're gonna convert it to the mole of the product. Okay, so the mole ratio between the reactant and product is one to one. So for every one mole of C8H8O3, one mole of HC7H5O3 is produced. And then you're going to convert it back to the mass by multiplying it uh, with the molar mass of the product, which is 138.12 grams per mole. So that's it. So even though it looks like kind of complicated, but eventually it's just a uh, mole ratio conversion, and then the conversion between the mass and mole, and the conversion between mole and mass again. After preparing the solution, the student place, places some of the solution in, into a beaker and then adds a sample of aluminum. 
the reaction represented by the following equation occurs. So one mole of aluminum in solid reacts with three moles of the silver in aqueous state to produce one mole of the aluminum um, in aqueous um, and then three moles of the silver in solid. The following diagram gives an incomplete particular representation of the reaction. The, big, the beaker on the left represents the system before the mixture reacts and complete drawing on the right to represent the system after the reaction has occurred. Be sure to include 1. the correct type and the number of the particles based on the number shown on the left and 2. the relative spacing to depict the appropriate phases. Okay, so now we observe that um, the cations of the silver um, are converted back to... Um, oh, I didn't do the calculation. Um, so now we know that the cations of the silver have been converted back to the silver. So um, silver and solid, which means they will um, solidify. Um, so it's going to be silver, silver. On the other hand, when aluminum um, atom is being converted into the aluminum um, ions um, because they're soluble in aqueous solution or they're soluble in the water, so they will be dispersed in the beaker. And now I will have to match the number of the moles. Um, so for every one mole of the aluminum, then it's three moles of the three particles of the of silver um, will be solidified. So this means that when when I have one aluminum um, going off, then I will have three of the silver. And then when you have the second aluminum going off to become aluminum um, cation, then I will have another three silver atoms solidifying. As part of the experimental procedure to purify the um, HC7, H503 crystals after the reaction is complete, the crystals are filtered from the reaction mixture, rinsed with distilled water, and dried. Some physical properties of HC7, H503 are given in the following table. Um, the student's experiment results in an 87% yield of dry HC7, H503. The student suggested some of the HC7, H503 crystals dissolved in the distal water during the rinsing step. Okay, 87%. Is the student's claim consistent with our calculated percent yield value? And justify your answer. Okay, so um, some of the um, the product crystals, the products are dissolved in the distilled water during the rinsing step, which means um, some of the products. are lost during the rinsing step and the mass is decreased. The mass is um, smaller than what it should be. Um, the experimental value of the mass is less than um, the actual value or the theoretical value. So it does make sense because 87% is uh, less than 100%. So the students claim is consistent with the percent yield calculated. And next, okay, so um, this graph is, um, this graph shows the isotopes of the same element. Um, and then usually we use this um, graph to calculate the average atomic mass um, by combining their, um, their mass and then the, the relative abundance, which is represented in terms of the percentage. Um, the mass spectrum of a pure sample of silicon is shown below. How many protons and how many neutrons are in the nucleus of an atom of the most abundant isotope? So this is the most abundant isotope, obviously, and then it has a mass of 28. Okay, so first up on the periodic table, I will have to spot the silicon. Silicon is right here, 
And then on top of this like cubicle, I have number 14, which means its atomic number is 14 um, or its proton number is 14. So the proton number is obviously um, 14, so 14 protons. And how I calculate the number of the neutron is by subtracting number of the protons from um, the atomic mass, 28. So 28 um, minus 14, that's equal to another 14. So there are 14 neutrons in this most abundant form of the um, silicon isotope. And write the ground state electron configuration of silicon. Okay, so when it's a ground state, it means like it's, um, it's the opposite of the excited state. Which means the electrons are filled from the lowest energy level possible. Okay, so silicon, um, again, has put a number of 14, which means it has 14 electrons as well. And then it's on, on the third energy shell. So it should be 1s2, and then 2s2, 2p6, 3s1, and then 3p2. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p2. Or if you want to use um, the noble gas to uh, represent it, then you can use the noble gas um, right above it. Okay, so silicon is on the third energy level. Then you will have to use the noble gas on the second energy level, which is a neon. Okay, so I use the bracket to represent it. The bracket neon already represents all of this. All of this can be abbreviated into uh, the bracket neon. So bracket neon 3s2, 3p2. So both of them are considered correct. The next question, um, two compounds that contain silicon are silicon dioxide and silicon tetrahydride. At 161 Kelvin, silicon tetrahydride boils, but silicon dioxide remains as a solid. Using principle of interparticular forces, explain the difference in boiling points. Again, this is a very, very typical type of the intermolecular force questions. Um, it's testing you on the difference in the boiling point, but boiling point, melting point, all of these um, are actually all related to the intermolecular force. So higher boiling point actually means higher intermolecular force, or higher melting point means higher um, intermolecular force. So obviously it's saying that silicon tetrahydride um, has a, a smaller um, intermolecular force compared to the silicon dioxide. Okay, so silicon dioxide, that's one of the common examples that we learn when we learn the covalent network structure. So silicon dioxide has covalent network structure, which means each of the atom is bonded to all every other atom. And there is no clear cut um, as one single unit as like molecule. So one silicon is bonded to four oxygen. And then every oxygen is bonded to um, two of the silicon. And again, one silicon, every silicon is bonded to four oxygen, and then it, it goes on. So um, every single atom is bonded to each other. So, um, and it is why a lot of covalent network structure has a very, very high melting point and boiling point. Um, so um, the, the, the diamond, the pure carbon, um, the graphite, they both have very, very high melting point about 4,000 Celsius degree, like 3,600 Celsius degree. It's because both of them have the covalent network structure. On the other hand, for the silicon tetrahydride, obviously it's a molecule. It's silicon um, covalently bonded to four hydrogen atom by silicon hydrogen in single bond. So silicon um, tetrahydride is a molecule and London dispersion force between silicon tetrahydride molecules are easier to break. Easier to break means it takes a less amount of energy to break. Easier to break compared to covalent bonds in silicon dioxide. So 
So um, I will briefly go over the intermolecular forces. So there are three types of intermolecular forces. Um, well, there are actually one more, um, ion, ion dipole force. Um, so intermolecular forces from the weakest to the strongest, it is a London dispersion force, which occurs between nonpolar molecules. And then the noble gas. The next is dipole-dipole attraction. Uh, which forms between the polar molecules. Next is hydrogen bonding, which forms between um, two molecules when one of the molecules has hydrogen covalently bonded to uh, oxygen or nitrogen or fluorine, like one of those like highly electronegative atoms. And then uh, when um, another molecule has either oxygen or nitrogen or fluorine, and then in between this hydrogen and then the highly electronegative um, uh, highly electronegative atom, they form a strong a strong dipole dipole attraction, which we call by hydrogen bonding. And then the next, the strongest one will be ion dipole force. So of course, by the name suggests, it occurs between an ion, either cation or anion, and then a, a dipole. And silicon tetrahydride, um, it has a, um, it is like nonpolar molecule, just like methane CH4, because it has a tetrahedral molecular geometry, and then all of the all of the four silicon hydrogen single bond um, <clears throat> is nonpolar. Uh, general shape of the graphs in chemistry sometime um yes like what kind of uh, general shape of the graphs um like what graphs are you referring to exactly <clears throat> oh okay the ionic and covalent strengths okay so intermolecular forces intermolecular means between the molecules and then um for the covalent bond and ionic bond they're just called chemical bonds right or metallic bonds so chemical bonds form between the atoms so for the chemical for the chemical bonds we have ionic bonds which is the strongest and then we have the covalent bond which is sharing of the electron and then we have a metallic bond which is just electron c model so metallic cations are just like some um submerged in a c um of or um of, of electrons and electrons are like liquid they're mobile so in general chemical bonds are way 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 stronger than intermolecular force so intermolecular force forms between the molecules chemical bonds be form between the atoms so atom atom like bonding is way 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 like stronger like so much stronger than intermolecular force What is negative MCAT is equal to MCAT? Um, can you elaborate on MCAT? Oh, do you mean MC delta T? Oh, Q is equal to MC delta T. Um, yes. Um, when I'm done with this, when I'm done with um all of the four units today and then if we if we have extra time i can try to go over that a little bit um i think for the enthalpy change um that should be unit <clears throat> unit six um so my plan was to go over it tomorrow but if you want me to go over it today i can do it okay so next um it's again the intermolecular force type of question um so um so before like 2014, 2016, I didn't see that many intermolecular force related questions in AP chemistry, but I feel like the new trend is there are a lot of intermolecular force related questions. Uh, Maxwell Boltzmann, okay, the heating curve concentration, V time, okay, bond energy, energy profile, mass spectrum. Uh, okay, okay, got it. Change. The structure and melting points for the methyl salicylate and salicylic acid are shown. Okay, melting point again, melting point of the molecules compared to melting point of molecules. This is comparing the intermolecular force 
um, type of question. The same th three types of intermolecular forces, London dispersion force, dipole-dipole, and hydrogen bonding exist among the molecules of each substance. Explain why the melting point of salicylic acid is higher than that of the methyl sali um, salicylate. Okay, so the melting point of this molecule is greater than this one. Okay, which means it has a stronger intermolecular force in general. Mm, well, let's take a look at it. So for uh, salicylic acid, now what I see is salicylic acid has two of the hydrogen bond um, that is Two, two of the hydrogen atoms that are covalently bonded to oxygen. So what I mean by that is it means um, the salicylic acid can form more of the hydrogen bond with other molecules. On the other hand, for the methyl salicylate, it has only one hydrogen atom bonded to an oxygen. So even though it has a lot more hydrogen here, but these hydrogen, these hydrogen atoms are covalently bonded to carbon, which is uh, which is not electronegative, which means carbon hydrogen bond is pretty much nonpolar. So they share the electrons equally. The hydrogen does not carry the partial positive charge. So these hydrogen are not going to form the hydrogen bond. Only this hydrogen forms the hydrogen bond um, with other molecules. So in general, or in conclusion, salicylic acid have twice as much um, hydrogen bond um, compared to um, methyl salicylate. So methyl salicylate has only one hydrogen bonded to oxygen, while salicylic acid two hydrogen atoms bonded to the oxygen. So more hydrogen bonding forms um, within the salicylic acid molecules. Oh, mass spectrum, okay. Um, then we can go back to mass, mass spectrum after we're done with intermolecular force, okay? Answer the following questions about the compounds of uh, NH2Cl and NCl3. The Lewis electron dot diagram of the two compounds are shown. Um, calculate the number of, of the moles of the NH2Cl present in one liters of the solution in which the concentration is 0 0.016 grams per liter. Okay, so this is just a, another simple stoichiometry question. So what you are given is the concentration, but usually concentration are given in the unit of mole per liters, um, but this one is given in grams per liters, so, you, so we'll have to do some conversion. So when it's the when it's a stoichiometry with um, gas involved, a lot of times we combine the ideal gas law. P times V is equal to NRT. Okay, and what I do is usually I try to match um, the unit. So grams per liters means that is mass divided by the volume. And then it's asking me to find the number of the moles. Okay, so what I do is, um, because number of moles is what I need to find, so I will rearrange this equation in terms of N. So N is equal to then P times V divided by RT. And then R is just um, the constant. So I don't have to care about it. So it will be 1 over R times PV over T. And then what I try to do is I try to plug in M over V. And then another given information is the molar mass. Okay, molar mass is written in terms of the capital letter M. And what is the <coughs> and what is the conversion formula between the mass, molar mass, and then the number of the moles? Mass is equal to number of the moles multiplied by um, the molar mass M. A push teachers, A P C S P. No, um, I only do math and science, but um, I have a friend who majored in history, 
um in college but i don't think she does any of the videos she does like private tutoring like one-to-one -one tutoring okay so again i can rewrite v um well give me one second e v divided by t um and um, oh sorry never mind i did this question wrong so it's not as complicated um we don't have to use the idea guess law so it's a simple conversion between the number of moles the moles molar mass and then the mass so mass is equal to number of moles multiplied by the molar mass um so for 0 0.0016 grams per liter that is a mass divided by volume so on the right side of the equation um, it's number of moles multiplied by the molar mass divided by the volume and i am given the volume and then i know the molar mass and then I am given the, the concentration. So now I can just plug in all the numbers. So 0 0.0016 grams per liter is equal to the number of moles multiplied by the molar mass of 51.48 grams per mole divided by the volume of 1.0 liters. So number of moles is equal to 0 0.0016 over 51.48 which is 3.1 times 10 to the power of negative 5 moles. And next, again, this is another intermolecular force type of question. NH2Cl is highly soluble in water, whereas NCl3 is nearly insoluble. Okay, so you are given the Lewis dot diagram of these two molecules. Explain this observation in terms of the types and relative strength of the intermolecular forces between each of the solutes and water. Okay, um, so what kind of what kind of compound is soluble in water when it can form the ion dipole force, which means the ionic compounds or the polar molecules? And this is because um, the different substances with similar types of the intermolecular force tend to dissolve um, with each other or blending well with each other, while um, the substance with different types of intermolecular force do, do not blend in well. So this explains exactly why oil and water do not dissolve well, because water primarily is the hydrogen bonding or the dipole-dipole interaction. Um, on the other hand, for the oil, like vegetable oils, they are long chunk like hydrocarbon chain. And in between these hydrocarbon chains, like London dispersion force is the only force that's working to hold them together so that's why water and oil do not mix well um and then based on the lewis dot diagram well let's see mm. oh okay okay so nh2cl um so both of them um okay so for the nh2cl it has a mm, it has a hydrogen um covalently bonded to the highly electronegative atom nitrogen um so for these two hydrogen, they carry a partial positive charge because nitrogen is um, highly electronegative, which means when sharing the electrons, electrons are not shared equally. And then all the electrons or most of the electrons are pulled or pulled um, toward the nitrogen. So hydrogen is left, left with very little electrons. It carries a partial positive charge. So this partial positive charge um, means that it can form the hydrogen bond with, mo with water molecule. That's why it's pretty much soluble in water. So NH2Cl forms hydrogen bonding with water molecules. That's why it's soluble. That's it. One sentence, that's enough. On the other hand, for the NCl3, it's nearly insoluble, okay? Because for the NCl3, NCl3, we only have the nitrogen and then the chlorine, which is halogen. So um, NCl3 can only form, uh, let's say, um, it can form uh, the dipole-dipole interaction. Yes. So the reason that NCl3 does not form, it also forms the London dispersion force with water molecule, but since this is a polar substance, so it's going to form dipole-dipole interaction.
And the next question is regarding electrical conductivity. So um, this is what we usually learn in unit two when it comes to chemical bonds. Um, so ionic solids, um, metallic solids, covalent solids, um, their electric electrical conductivity are all different. Um, so let's say for ionic compounds, when they are in the solid phase, they do not actually um, conduct electricity because the cations and anions are fixed in the position and they're not free to move. Um, but when they're dissolved in um, aqueous solution um, or when they're in um, the liquid phase, they um, the, the cations and anions are free to move around. Um, so they do conduct electricity. And um, when it comes to metallic, metallic um, when it comes to the metals, because of the electrons de model, electrons are pretty much delocalized or they're not fixed in the position. Electrons are free to move, so it does conduct electricity, no matter if it's in the solid phase, the liquid phase, or the gaseous phase. And for the covalent bonds, for the, sorry, for the uh, covalent solids, or for the covalent compounds, um, covalent bond means that the electrons are shared because electrons are tightly bonded between these two atoms, so no free electrons moving around. So obviously covalent solids do not conduct electricity. So calcium sulfate and then the lead sulfate. The student has sample of both compounds, which are white powders. The student tested electrical conductivity of each solid and observed that neither solid conducts electricity because obviously both are ionic compounds. So calcium, um, and calcium usually forms the calcium two plus cation and sulfate SO four two minus. This is one of the most common type of the polyatomic ion. And for the lead sulfate, it's also lead two plus and then sulfate two minus. Describe the structure of the solids that account for their inability to conduct electricity. So in between cations and anions, they are going to form this strong ionic bond. So ionic bonds form between cations and the anions. And in solid phase, um, these Ionic compounds are in the lattice, crystal lattice structure. So ions are not free to move. Oh, okay. Bye, Gabby. I will see you tomorrow. And the student places excess calcium sulfate in so solid in a beaker containing 100 milliliters of water and places excess lead sulfate um, in another beaker containing 100 milliliters of water. The student stirs the contents of the beakers and then measures the electrical conductivity of the solution in each beaker. The student observes that the conductivity of the solution in the beaker containing calcium sulfate is higher than the conductivity of the solution in the beaker containing the lead sulfate. Okay, which compound is more soluble in water? Mm. And just for your answer, based on the result of the conductivity set test. Okay, um, so the more ions dissolve in the water, it means more of the free ions and like uh, being able to, being able to move around in the solution. So higher conductivity test um, for the calcium sulfate means that calcium sulfate dissolves more in water compared to lead sulfate. So calcium sulfate is more soluble. Oh uh, wait. 
So true, you asked me a question. Um, is this because polar polar molecules are soluble? Yes. So um, polar 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 and polar they are soluble. Nonpolar and nonpolar they are soluble. So let's say butter and vegetable oils. Um, both substances are nonpolar, like long hydrocarbon, long hydrocarbon chain. So the primary, um, the, the the primary intermolecular force in between these long hydrocarbon chains are um, the intermolecular force, very strong intermolecular force. Um, but uh, in between the water and ionic compounds, it's usually the ion dipole force um, in between the polar substance and water, um, then it is like hydrogen bonding or the very strong dipole dipole interaction. So the same type of molecules or the same type of substance means the same type of intermolecular force um, forms between the particles. And then next is the Lewis electron dot diagram. Okay, so um, drawing the Lewis dot diagram is actually the most basic one, but I do still find some of my students do mistakes. Um, so for HCOOH, so how I do it, there are two steps. First off, I will have to calculate all of the um, the number, the total number of the valence electrons in this molecule. So hydrogen has valence electron of one, um, carbon has a valence electron of four, and then oxygen has a valence electron of six. So it's going to be one plus four plus six plus six plus one, which is um, 18 in total, which means for this molecule, you have only 18 electrons at most. But for most of the molecule, we need to satisfy the requirement that each of the um, atom um, uh, fulfills the, the full octet state, which means each atom has like eight valence electrons um, in the end after sharing the electrons. Then I have one, two, three, four, five, five atoms. So five times eight, because full octet state means eight valence electrons, that is equal to 40 electrons. So 40 minus 18, that is equal to Actually, never mind. Sorry. Let me let me go back because um, we have hydrogen. So a hydrogen for the hydrogen, the full octet state means two, and then for all the other atoms, the full octet state is eight. So it's two of the hydrogen multiplied by two, and three other atoms uh, with full octet state, so eight valence electrons, which is four plus twenty four or 26 electrons. So what I actually need 26 electrons to fulfill the a full octet state. So 26 minus 18 is equal to eight. Okay, which means I am eight electrons short. So what am I gonna do with this? So which means I will have to share eight, ele eight electrons. Eight electrons are shared in between the, in, in, in within this molecule. So eventually, this is what I drew. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Wait, I do have ten. Wait, did I do any of the um, calculation wrong? Uh, carbon, oxygen, oxygen. Mm. Oh, sorry, never mind. I did a calculation wrong. Yeah, I was wondering why it's so weird. So 4 plus 24, that is equal to 28. So eventually, I, I need 28 electrons. So yes, um, the 28 minus 18, that is equal to 10 electrons, which means that I am 10 electrons short. Um, so 10 electrons short. What I mean by that is um, within all of the atoms within this molecule, in between all the atoms, I will share... I will have 10 electrons shared. So 10 electrons as the bonding pair. So um, that's why I have three of the single bonds and then two of the double bonds. So in total, that is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then on top of that, I can just draw the lone pair electron. Let's say for the oxygen um, to fulfill the full octet state, that's eight valence electrons. And now it has one, two, three, four, four bonding pairs. So eight minus four, that is four, which means it has four bond, lone pair. One, two, three, four. For this oxygen, it's the same eight minus 
one, two, three, four. Subtract the four on bonding pair, then it is four lone pair. So one, two, three, four. For the carbon, it's exactly the same. Eight minus the number of the uh, the bonding pair. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight minus eight, that's zero, which means that the carbon does not has does not have any of the lone pair. And then if you do the same calculation for the hydrogen, you will see that there is no uh, lone pair for both of the hydrogen atoms. And next, it's a net ionic equation question. Um, in aqueous solution, the compound H2 and NH2 react according to the equation above. Um, a 50 milliliter sample of uh, a 0.25 molar of N2, um, 0.25 molar of H2 and NH2 is combined with 50 milliliter sample of 0.25 HCOOH. Okay. Um, write the balanced net ionic equation for the reaction that occurs between um, these two. Okay. Mm. Okay, so um, it's going to be H uh, 2 and NH2 and HCOOH. Okay, but when it comes to net ionic equation, first off, I will have to write the balanced ionic equation. Then balanced ionic equation means I'm going to write every single reactant um, into in terms of the uh, of the dissociated ions. So for the H2 and NH2, obviously it dissociates into these two. So it's H2 and NH3 plus in aqueous with hydroxide ions in aqueous. And for the HCOOH, it decomposes into HCOO -O minus in aqueous and then H plus in aqueous, the protons. Okay, and then um, obviously the hydroxide ion and then um, the protons combine together to form water molecule, H2O in liquid, and then H2NNH3 plus, and then HCOO minus in aqueous. And then you're going to cancel out whatever um, that occurs on both sides of the uh, equation. Um, and then eventually what's left over is the net ionic equation. Okay, so we have only 15 minutes left. Um, so if you guys have any question, you can just type it in the chat box. I will try to answer your question. We still have like um, a lot of questions to go over, um, but we can go over them tomorrow. We can just continue on tomorrow. Oh, what the products will be. Um, so for the net ionic equation, usually the, um, okay, so for the net ionic equation, the reactants are always two aqueous solutions. It's always the aqueous solution uh, plus another aqueous solution. So for the aqueous, I mean that they dissociate into like cations and anions and water or in aqueous solution. And then usually they're going to form, let's say, water, such as like liquid, then it water d does not really dissociate much or they're going to form some kind of precipitate. Um, but, but in AP chemistry, you're not required to memorize the, the solubility rule. So um, usually if it's precipitate, it will be like stated in the question. When using rice, looking what the equation. Uh, oh, what the equation will make. Mm. Uh, uh.
Mm, okay, but for the ICE table, um, so you set up the ICE table only when you know what the product is, right? So you will use ICE table especially um for the equilibrium a lot, but it's when, only when you know what the products are. Otherwise, like ICE table just doesn't make sense. So can you just elaborate more on your question? Do you mean you have trouble like setting up the like writing the equation, or do you have trouble like using the ICE table to actually calculate? Um, like equilibrium constant or like one of the product, one of the products. Yeah, writing the equation. Um. Okay. <sighs> Um, then for, um, is there any specific type of reaction that you struggle with, such as acid base reaction or like precipitation reaction or combustion reaction? Cause like these are basically just a different types of the reaction that you learn during the whole course. It's not like you just learning for a very specific unit, just everything. So for example, you just need to be, you just need to be able to, um, spot like different types, identify different types of reaction. So let's say for combustion reaction. So anything that reacts with, oh, acid base. Okay. So especially for the acid base reaction. Okay. Um, so acid base is especially challenging. Um, so for the acid base, first off, you will have to define if this is weak acid, weak base, or strong acid, strong base. So for example, if it's strong acid reacting with strong base, for example, um, if it's hydrochloric acid reacting with sodium hydroxide, Okay, so then actually strong acid and strong base, they um, completely dissociate in aqueous solution. So they form protons and a chloride and sodium cation and then the hydroxide because they completely dissociate because they're strong acid. That's how we define strong acid and strong base. Um, any acid or base that completely dissociates in water. And um, in water, they are going to form H2O in liquid, and then the sodium plus, and then the chloride. And sodium and chloride, okay, they're just table salt. And okay, imagine that you put the, you dissolve the table, table salt in water, they just automatically dissolve. They do not form the precipitate because they are ion compounds, they have high solubility. Um, so um, they do not dissolve, they remain, they are dissociate, they're in they're, they're the separate form of the sodium cations and chloride anions. So these two are called what we call by the spectator ions. They do not actually participate in the reaction. So for the net ionic equation, I will have the protons reacting with hydroxide and produce the water, water in liquid. So this is a typical strong acid reacting with strong base. And if it is strong acid with weak base okay so only strong strong acid dissociate oh pops you have a different question what is the ph mixture okay um so i'm gonna go over your question after i'm done with um the strong acid with weak base um so strong acid dissociates again so let's say again hydrochloric acid reacts with weak base such as um, ammonia, ammonia, NH3, it is weak base. Then ammonia does not dissociate. So it's proton and chloride, they're dissociated, they're completely dissociated, and then NH3. Okay, so um, this is still base, even though it's a weak, it's weak, but it's still base and acid and base, they always react with each other and neutralize, which means these two react to form ammonium NH4 plus and the chloride Cl minus. And again, the chloride, um, chloride ions, they occur in the, in both the reactant and the product. So, um, I'm going to cross them out. So for the net ionic equation, it is protons 
reacting with ammonia to produce ammonium. Okay, and then your question, what is the pH of a mixture? Okay, so first up, what is the pH? pH scale is, um, is a scale um, that we that the human beings we came up with to um, just represent the acidity like for convenience. Because for the acidity, how we represent it is by measuring the concentration of the protons or measuring the concentration of the hydronium ions. So let's say 10 to the power of negative 7 mole per liters. Um, it means that the pH value is 7. The reason is because in real world, we don't really use the number like 10 to the power of negative 7. It doesn't, um, like it's, it's, we don't even know, know, use the scientific like notation in real world, right? That's just inconvenient. Um, so pH is just a convenient way to represent acidity. How strong, um, how, um, how strong or how much of the acid these solution have. So, so to find the pH, we will have to find the concentration of the hydronium or the protons. So in your question, we have 45.1. Oh, okay. So 45.1 milliliters of 1.2 molar of hydrofluoric acid and then 50 milliliters of 0 0.5 molar of sodium hydroxide. Okay, so first off, um, um, they have different um, concentration. They have different um, uh, the volume, which means I will have to calculate the number of moles um, when it comes to ICE table. So first off, the reaction in between them is HF reacting with NaOH. Okay, then NaOH is that strong base or weak base. Anything that has that carries the hydroxide is strong base, which means it dissociates completely into sodium and hydroxide. And for the hydrofluoric acid, hydrochloric acid, hydrofluoric acid, hydroiodic acid, um, all of these three, um, sorry, hydrofluoric acid, hydrochloric acid, and hydrobromic acid, all of these um, are. HCl, HBr, and HI, they're all strong acid, and hydrofluoric acid is not a strong acid. This is actually a weak acid. Okay, so this is a reaction between strong base and weak acid. Okay, so for the weak acid, it does not dissociate, but still it is acid. So eventually what's actually reacting is the acid and the base. So it's sodium cation and H2O and then F minus. So sodiums, sodium ions are spectator ions. Um, they do not participate in the reaction. So for the net ionic equation, it is hydrofluoric acid reacting with hydroxide ions and it produces water and fluoride anions. And now I can use the ICE table. Okay, so for the hydrofluoric acid, um, we are gonna use N is equal to M times V. Um, molarity multiplied by the volume. So it's going to be 1.2 times 45.1, which is 54.12 millimole. For the hydroxide, it's 50 times 0 0.5, 25 millimoles. Okay, um, so which one is the limiting reagent? Um, the reactant with a less amount. So hydroxide is the limiting reagent, so the amount of change is 25. So negative 25 for the reactants and positive 25 for um, the, the product. And water molecule, okay, so 25 milli, millimoles of water, that's basically nothing. So we don't actually have to consider that. Um, and in total, at equilibrium, or ICF, and final, I will have 29.12 millimoles of the hydrofluoric, zero of the hydroxide, and then 25 millimole of the fluoride. Okay, so in the, in, in, in the eventually, uh, when the reaction is completed, what I have in the reaction is hydrofluoric acid and the fluoride. So this is the buffer solution. Buffer solution has a, the pair of the conjugate acid and base. And I don't have any of the hydroxide ions. So for the buffer, how we calculate the pH is pH is equal 
to pKa plus the log of the ratio um, concentration of the conjugate base divided by the concentration of the acid. Okay, so the thing is, we don't have to calculate the concentration in this question because these two are dissolved in the same aqueous solution, the same sample. So I just need to plug in the number of the moles. So it will be pKa value for the hydrofluoric acid plus the log of the concentration uh, ratio, which is the mole ratio, so 25 over 29.12. So um, I guess that's it for today. Um, okay, so if you guys don't have any other question, then I will wrap up and then um, I will I will hold another live stream session tomorrow. Um, I'm gonna take a look at my schedule and then it might it might be a little bit late, probably 8 p.m or it might be 7 p.m. Um, I'm gonna check my schedule and post it on my YouTube channel.